Imagine if you could easily find solutions to make your region or city smarter, greener, better connected, more social, and closer to citizens. The InterAg Europe Policy Learning Platform can help you. Access knowledge about the latest policy trends. Discover expert validated good practices from all over Europe. Find solutions in our peer review. Get tailored support from our expert team. We can connect you with the right people and organizations. Together, we will find ways to solve your region's or city's challenges. Start your policy learning journey today. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to this webinar on Industry 5.0, which is organized by Interreg Europe uh, Policy Learning Platform. I am uh, René Tönisson and working as a semantic expert on SME competitiveness uh, for uh, Policy Learning Platform. And today I will be moderating this webinar together with my colleagues, uh, Luc and uh, Lotter. Uh, uh, I'm very glad uh, to uh, announce that uh, this webinar ha has attracted initially a big interest. We have almost uh, 300 registered participants. So I hope uh, most of uh, those people who signed up will also be able to join. And we have an exciting one and a half hours ahead of us uh, discussing different aspects of Industry 5.0 concept. We will start with a presentation uh, made by Sean O'Regan. Uh, he's a head of uh, Industry 5.0 unit, uh, Industry 5 unit at European Commission. And we are very grateful uh, that he was able to join us and he will uh, then uh, share some of the latest uh, developments uh, in terms of, uh, of policy development for Industry 5.0. After that, we will have uh, three uh, presentations based on good practices from Interreg Europe uh, policy learning uh, uh, community. And uh, we will be looking at uh, green and uh, digital transition as well as impact uh, investing uh, parts. And we will introduce uh, uh, each of the speaker at, at the beginning of, uh, of, of each presentation. Uh, All together, as I said, we have uh, one and a half hours. Uh, and uh, after each presentation, you will also be able to ask questions from the uh, participants. Uh, however, we do strongly suggest that uh, you would uh, write your questions uh, to the chat. Uh, as you see in, in, in the middle of the bottom, you have the chat box. And uh, that would be the easiest way to manage the questions if you write them during the presentation or at the end of the presentation. There is a possibility to also ask questions using your microphone. So in that case, you have to raise uh, your hand and indicate your interest, but, uh, but it would be more practical if, uh, if you use the chat channel for putting the questions uh, forward. Uh, we uh, will have this seminar uh, recorded, so there is always a uh, possibility to come back to it and, uh, and uh, see it again. And we will, of course, be sharing, uh, sharing the presentations uh, after the, after the uh, webinar is over. Uh, having said that, I think we can now uh, move to our main program, and uh, I would like then to invite our first speaker, uh, Sean Reagan from European Commission, to make their opening presentation on Industry 5.0. And Sean, if that's fine with you, perhaps uh, before uh, starting your presentation, you can also shortly introduce yourself and your background and previous previous activities uh, so people would also have uh, your personal background a bit more clear. 
Sean, it's all yours. Go ahead, and uh, and uh, you have twenty five minutes for your presentation. Uh, thank you, uh, Renee. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you see my slides clearly? Yes, we can. Very good. Uh, so um, I'm very pleased to be with you this afternoon for this uh, very uh, interesting webinar. Um, so I am the deputy head of unit in uh, DG Research and Innovation in the European Commission. Uh, responsible for uh, Industry 5.0. Um, and um, I have a long experience working with industry uh, at European level, uh, having previously worked in uh, the Director General for Small and Medium Sized Industry, and then in the Director General uh, for Enterprise, now DG Grow. Um, and so I, a couple of years ago, I joined the team as we began uh, to uh, Wrote, developed the, the concept of Industry 5.0. So I'm very pleased to be able to be with you today uh, to say a little bit about the concept and where we are now uh, with its implementation. So when we talk about Industry 5.0, we're very much in the area of digitalization of, of industry. Um, digitalization is transforming European industry very rapidly indeed, uh, accelerating production processes and also changing uh, the role of, of workers. In the early stages of digitalization of industry, the focus was very much on the factory floor and how to increase efficient, efficiency and productivity uh, within uh, manufacturing companies. And this transformation broadly has been termed uh, industry uh, 4.0. An industry 5.0, let's be clear, it's not a revolution uh, compared to what's gone before. It's much more about uh, seeing the role of, of, of digitalization uh, in industry in a broader way that will allow industry um, to play the role it traditionally has more widely in the economy and society. So essentially, industry 5.0 has uh, three pillars. Uh, the first pillar is human centricity. Um, it's about capitalizing on the talents and the diversity of uh, workers in the workplace uh, by empowering them and to make them part of the digitalization journey rather than simply uh, accepting the process. Uh, in this way, we see that uh, Industry 5.0 can make manufacturing companies more resilient um, by uh, applying digital technologies in a way uh, which is flexible and which allows them to, to, to adapt to changing circumstances. So making companies more agile and in this way being more resilient. And resilience clearly is very topical at the moment uh, in following the, the COVID crisis and given uh, the, the impact of the uh, Russia, Russian invasion of Ukraine. And then the third pillar of Industry 5.0 is very much focusing on industry's role uh, in supporting and, and taking forward sustainability uh, by using digital technologies in a way that allows companies um, to uh, operate in a more sustain sustainable way uh, and in a way particularly that respects planetary boundaries. So in a nutshell, uh, Industry 5.0 uh, is about recognizing the power that industry has to, to achieve wider e economic and societal goals that go beyond uh, growth and jobs, and so that they can become a resilient provider of prosperity for European society um, by ensuring that uh, production respects the boundaries of our planet and also puts the well being of the industrial worker at the center of the, of the, of the production process. So why have we de developed the concept of Industry 5.0 and where do we see it as, 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 uh, as being valuable and critical? Um, for, first of all, uh, we see it uh, as um, really bringing the worker to the center of the whole process of digitalization um, by uh, empowering workers so that they remain at the center of, 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 of the process in, 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 in companies and are not simply put aside and uh, have to accept the technology that is brought in. Um, this in turn, to, to achieve this, uh, it's very important that we have 
training that is adapted in a way that takes account that, of the fact that digitalization and the innovation that it is driving um, is, is, means there's a, a rapid evolution of, of, of skills needs and that therefore workers need to continually to develop and adapt to their skills uh, and that, that they need to be supported in this. Uh, thirdly, very important aspect from the point of view of human centricity is that by combining uh, human centricity with uh, the application of digital technologies, we can improve safety and well-being uh, of workers in the workplace. Essentially, the, the, the machines can do the dirty work um, and the workers can then take on the value added aspects uh, and work with the machines to, to improve the overall efficiency and competitiveness of, of the company. Um, also, we see this as a way of making industry more competitive because the workers coming into the, into the jobs market now, um, they have very specific demands. They want to work for companies that respect their values. And so by taking the Industry 5.0 route, it helps industry to attract the best talent that's coming onto the marketplace. Workers with these digital skills are scarce. They're in high demand. We need them in the industry and the way of, of, of doing that is to make an attractive work environment for them. Um, also very important, of course, for, for industry is we see this Industry 5.0, the three pillars of helping uh, to reduce costs because they will uh, make the use of resources more efficient. Um, and overall, then we see that this will help European companies to have a competitive edge in new markets. So we would see Industry 5.0 as a solution provider, both for, for people, for citizens, and also for, for, for our planet. So let's say a little bit more about the human, human centricity uh, pillar. Um, what we're talking about here essentially is moving from a, a, a technology-driven approach, which puts uh, uh, the, the machine in, and, and the digital technologies in first place and sees workers as just accepting these to a more human-centric approach, which involves workers in the way in which digital technologies are brought into the company. And this leads to uh, a more efficient outcome for, for the company and a more rewarding um, job profile for the workers. Uh, also, it, it, it ensures safer and, and, and qualitative jobs that take into account the importance of the well-being of the worker. I think at the heart of, of this, the Industry 5.0 therefore sees workers as investments for the company and not a mere cost. So that by investing in, in their training and in their development, uh, the workers can actually add value uh, to companies as they move on their digitalization journey. Um, and we see the technologies in, in this framework as being there uh, to enhance the capacities of workers uh, to contribute in the workplace and also as a means of fostering the creativity of workers uh, and, uh, and allowing greater empowerment in this way. Human, this human-centric approach that we see in Industry 5.0 is also very important if we're, if we're to attract the best talents to industry. Um, digital skills are scarce in the digital age um, and those who have these skills are very much in demand right across the economy. Um, and there are many sur surveys that show that uh, uh, young people coming onto the job market now want employers who share their values. Um, and as we've seen with the, the great resignation as it's called in the United States, uh, these workers will leave companies if they feel they don't share their, their, their values. And this is more important in many cases to workers than the, 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 the salary that they're paid. They want to work for, uh, in an environment that fits with their, with their values and the way they want to take their, their careers. Industry 5.0 helps to address uh, this uh, need of workers coming onto the market now. The second uh, pillar I would like to address is the sustainability aspect. What we're talking about here is enhancing the resource efficiency of um, uh, companies, of, of manufacturing companies, uh, so that they can do better with less. Um, what we're talking about is adopting a, a full life cycle perspective um, 
that uh, takes into account the capacity for uh, reuse, for um, uh, remodeling and, and, and uh, um, recycling of, um, as, of products and, 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 pro and processes in one industry that can be used elsewhere. So that overall, we improve the environmental outcome uh, uh, of industry in the wider context of uh, the, the challenges faced um, by um, the need for greater sustainability. And in this context, we see this being very much relevant to how we can contribute to the achievement of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. We see Industry 5.0 and its sustainability pillar as very much addressing uh, SDG 9 in relation to industry, innovation and infrastructure, and also SDG 12 uh, in relation to uh, responsible production and consumption. Um, I, I mean, industry is a significant contributor to EU emissions, despite the fact that there have been significant improvements in uh, the in emissions performance, industry needs to go much further. And we see that by applying digital technologies in a way that supports sustainability in this way, this is the route by which industry in the future can contribute uh, more to achieving uh, European and global uh, sustainability goals. The third aspect that, and the third pillar of Industry 5.0 is resilience. And this has become highly topical, of course. Um, we have seen that, uh, uh, first of all, the, the, the challenges posed by, by the COVID pandemic and now with the geopolitical situation rising from the Russian invasion of Ukraine, that uh, resilience has become a huge challenge for industry. And um, what, we're, what we're seeing is that those companies that have applied uh, industry 5.0 approaches by taking a flexible and adaptive approach to adoption of, of, of digital technologies uh, are those that seem to be uh, having the best results in the current uh, uncertain uh, business environment and, and are demonstrating the strongest level of resilience. Um, very important in this aspect is having the appropriate skill sets that allow companies to apply the technologies in a way that gives them the necessary flexibility and, and adaptability. Um, we, we have gone from a situation where the focus was very much on increasing globalized um, supply chains to a situation where there's a need to be very flexible, very adaptive, be able to, to move quickly, being agile uh, in, 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 in addressing changes in, in market conditions or in, in, supply, in, in relation to supply. So having workers who can uh, help with that and in this way help companies to really revisit and where necessary to, to adapt their supply change, chains to these change circumstances is very important. And this also plays into the wider societal role uh, envisaged for industry uh, under the Industry 5.0 concept, because by being resilient, industry will maintain its employment, will continue to, to contribute to the economy and society, and this will enhance the, the role that uh, industry has traditionally played uh, as a driver of prosperity more widely in the economy and society. The concept is, is, is very clear, but making it happen is going to be very challenging. Uh, it will need uh, concrete and concerted action across a wide range of policy areas. Um, clearly, one of these is regional. Uh, it will be a particular need uh, for policies uh, that support European regions that are facing major transitions um, and helping them uh, to uh, have equip their, their, their industry with the necessary tools to capitalize on the opportunities of, of Industry 5.0. Um, and in that regard, one interesting feedback we've been getting um, in our conversations uh, across the regions of Europe is that particularly in regions that depend a lot on, on SMEs, that uh, Industry 5.0 can in fact be a very effective way for SMEs to, to, to uh, advance on their digitalization journey, because a lot of those, if they apply digital technologies uh, directly, tend to come face barriers due to problems of absorptive capacity and, cap and problems with raising the necessary investment. Whereas by taking the broader approach to digitalization that we envisage with Industry 5.0, uh, SMEs 
uh, seem to, to uh, find this a way of actually helping them to achieve their, their, their digitalization goals. Um, other policy areas that will be very important include um, taxation and to, in, to ensure that the taxation system support um, the move towards a green uh, human centric uh, industry. Also employment and social policy will be very important, uh, taking account of the need that there will be now a dynamic uh, and evolving uh, market for, for, for skills, needs and employability. That we're going to see a rapid ch change in, in labour markets driven by digitalisation um, and the need for employment policy to be flexible uh, enough to, to uh, support these changes in the appropriate way. Also, uh, in so the area of social policy, uh, aspects like social security uh, and inclusiveness in ensuring that, that everyone uh, has the opportunity to engage uh, and, uh, in the opportunities for, for skills development, for um, uh, working in industry uh, towards the, the Industry 5.0 goal will be important. Uh, linked to that, of course, is the education system. Uh, we will need to see, very importantly, uh, greater opportunities for women to engage and for encouraging entrepreneurial skills because where you see the, the empowerment that Industry 5.0 can give rise to, then this gives an opportunity uh, for entrepreneurial development, both inside companies, but also through spin-offs. Uh, and at the same time, uh, we we'll need to, to, to really ensure that we, we have the appropriate skills profiles. We will need to develop further uh, STEM skills. Um, in the area of environment also, of course, in, to achieve the sustainability goals that we see uh, under Industry 5.0, uh, there will be need for uh, policy to ensure prevention of industrial waste and more, in a more positive sense, the development of secondary materials markets that can support uh, recycling and reuse. And of course, uh, technology, uh, research and development policy also plays its part, but I mentioned this last because on its own, research and, 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 and development will not achieve Industry 5.0 fully, but very much our policy approach is to focus more on how we can encourage the development of human-centric uh, technologies. Clearly, industry is in the lead in moving towards Industry 5.0, but at a policy level, we need to, to, to support it right across the, the, these different policy areas. And already, in the area of research and innovation, uh, we're looking at ways in which we can help to make Industry 5.0 happen. Uh, at the beginning of this year, we launched the first ever Industry 5.0 award uh, open to European projects. We were very positively surprised that we had almost 60 applications for it. And indeed, the standard was, was very high. We had a, a jury of distinguished personalities from the world of, of industry, of business, and of the trade unions who uh, uh, judged the award. Uh, the, the winner will be announced at the forthcoming European Research and Innovation Days uh, uh, in, at the end of, of this month. Um, we see uh, the winners and, the, and the, the finalists and indeed those others who participated in the award as being the pioneers who are helping to show the way in which Industry 5.0 can be applied across a range of sectors and by a range of different uh, sizes and, and, and shapes of, of, of company. Um, also, we've had a first round table with industry uh, leaders to get the, 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 the clear views of those on the ground as to what they see as being the opportunities and also the bottlenecks with the implementation of Industry 5.0. And uh, they came out with some very clear um, views for us. They fully backed the approach to Industry 5.0. They see this is the way forward to go. And working with them, we have identified a number of priority measures uh, that we will now look to, to, to implement uh, in research and innovation policy and indeed uh, in, in liaison with our colleagues in other policy areas at European level. Uh, thirdly, we're beginning now to, to integrate Industry 5.0 into the Horizon Europe work programs. In the, the first work program uh, of uh, Horizon Europe 2021-2022, we had one topic uh, on related to Industry 5.0 on the aspect of skills. It was very heavily subscribed, very high standard uh, of, uh, of proposals. Um, so we will, and the, the, the successful projects from that are just now 
uh, they're having their kickoff meetings this month. So we will certainly be, 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 be following up the skills dimension in the next work program of, of Horizon Europe. But I think we will also be looking at other aspects of Industry 5.0, uh, trying to understand uh, what are the bottlenecks uh, to implementation of Industry 5.0 um, and uh, wh where can policy best in, in intervene? And also, uh, uh, can we identify um, areas where we could possibly develop um, lighthouses or, 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 or pilots that can show the way to how Industry 5.0 can be implemented in different uh, industrial settings. So the work programs, uh, the 423-24, are currently being finalized. Um, they will be going to the member states for approval uh, in the coming weeks, and we expect uh, the formal launch uh, to be at the beginning of 2023. So at that stage, there will be an opportunity for people across Europe, as usual, to put together consortia to make proposals to apply for funding under Horizon Europe for topics specifically related to Industry 5.0. Um, another aspect that we're working very closely at European level with is um, in connection with our colleagues in the European Institute of Technology Manufacturing. Um, they have a very strong um, education dimension uh, to uh, the, the uh, to their their work, and we're now seeing how uh, we can work with them to ensure that their curricula for their their training and their management courses uh, fit well uh, with uh, uh, Industry 5.0, and so can also support the further development of the concept uh, and the implementation, indeed, of Industry 5.0. So we're, we're now beginning, as I said, to look at how we can uh, directly um, have topics on Industry 5.0 in our work programs. But in fact, uh, in EU funded research projects over the last number of years have helped us to, to, to see the way to how to, to develop and begin to implement uh, the concept of Industry 5.0. I'll highlight just three examples here of these projects. Uh, the first one is a project called Beyond 4.0. Um, which is really looking at how the, this human-centric dimension, how the future of new technologies uh, can best impact on, 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 on jobs, uh, on business models, but also on wider societal welfare. Um, and the second one, human manufacturing, again, focusing very much on the, the uh, human-centric dimension, uh, is about demonstrating how uh, factory workers and automation can, 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 can work together in harmony in a way um, that on the one hand improves uh, productivity and performance of the company, but also improves job satisfaction and worker safety. Um, the third project is Kickdust 4.0, uh, which brings together uh, a, whole, a whole range of different tech digital technologies, um, including cyber uh, physical systems, uh, augmented reality and artificial intelligence, together with aspects like product cycle, life cycle manufacturing and management and life cycle assessment, how these can be really brought together to uh, transform in way, the ways in which we try to implement circular manufacturing in Europe. So I think I'll, I'll stop there. Um, if anyone would like to uh, have uh, further information, uh, we, we, we have a dedicated area of uh, the Europa website dealing with the Industry 5.0, where you can find a lot more information and uh, in due course, the information regarding topics related to Industry 5.0 in the, the forthcoming work program will also be uh, available there. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Son, uh, for, for such a great uh, uh, focused and uh, uh, kind of clear presentation. Uh, I can ask now my co colleague, Luke, to take a look at uh, the chat if we have got any questions uh, which uh, people would like to Sean to answer. Uh, yes, Rene, we, we have some, some questions. Uh, some of them are very specific, so we, we might not mm. have the time to address them all. Uh, I have one, one question from uh, Michael Arada. He asked, uh, what are the principles of Industry uh, 5.0? If Sean could specify a bit on, on that. Well, I think the, the, I, I, I think I've made fairly clear that the principles are three. 
uh, first of all, human centricity, uh, secondly, uh, sustainability, and thirdly, resilience. Those are the three principles, those are the three pillars of Industry 5.0. Yeah, I think that's what I understand too. I was okay. I, told, uh, I have a, a complimentary question also from from Michael, but also from my my side about the the metrics. And you you meant you started to mention the award, and I would suspect probably there would at some point be some kind of um, like it is for digital in digital technologies in general, uh, so some kind of uh, European scorecard or something like this. Or and uh, if if you already have an idea or of the level of transformation of the industry towards 5.0, if there is already a significant number of companies uh, going towards uh, this, this new product. I think we're, we're still at quite an early stage of the Industry 5.0 mm -hmm. journey. Um, so we're beginning now to think about metrics. Um, there may be a, 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 a topic in, 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 in the, the work program that will look at that, but already in the EU, Indust EU Industrial Scoreboard, which is published on an annual basis, we're looking at having a, a chapter in relation to Industry 5.0. Okay. So that would probably be the first step to, to, to integrate uh, the metrics in Industry 5.0 with the existing information uh, on the competitiveness of European industry. Because we're already we're seeing evidence that companies that, that uh, take the Industry 5.0 route are, do have a competitive advantage over time. I think beyond that, we will uh, begin to, to, to look at uh, oh, perhaps a wider scoreboard but I think we're at this stage, rather than looking at uh, who's doing best, what we're really trying to identify is uh, who are the pioneers, who are those who are taking Industry 5.0 forward, and who can we learn from, and to, to share the, the, these, these best practices. Uh, and then I think in the second stage, we will integrate something in the, in the scoreboard. And then in a the third stage, I can well see that we will, uh, uh, when we have a, a, a broad body of evidence, we will begin to develop metrics mm -hmm. uh, to really measure uh, where the success with Industry 5.0 can be seen most clearly. Okay, thank you for that. I have a, maybe Rene, we have, do we have time to to for one or two other questions? Uh, yes, yes, so we yeah. can take the, let's say two more questions. Yeah, I have at least one coming. I, I probably maybe uh, Sean, it refers to the the, the role of the, the EIT um, manufacturing. Probably uh, Magda was asking about the role and the and the potential of. of PhD students uh, to 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 bring into companies uh, this industry 5.0 principles because it's she feels that it's difficult for PhD to sell the skills to industrial actors because they sometimes are considered as more specialist as theory rather than practice maybe that's different from country to country so uh, it's will there be a specific role into the, the, the EIT manufacturing of, uh, of uh, addressing the, the PhDs and bringing, bringing them to the industry? I can't speak in detail for EIT manufacturing, but that's exactly the kind of way we would see things going, that they would, the true EIT manufacturing, there would be possibilities for um, development of, of the, uh, the skills towards a career in manufacturing for uh, those at all levels, right up to PhD and, and, and even postdoctoral, um, yeah. to, to allow them, because you're, you're, you've hit a very important point that uh, uh, digitalization of industry means that industry will need the highest caliber of people. And that's why we're putting so much emphasis on the fact that Industry 5.0 should help to create an attractive work environment um, that would draw these people in. But clearly, you're quite right that they, they uh, industry must be aware that these people have relevance for them and we hope that EIT manufacturing can play an important role uh, given its, its mandate vis-a-vis -vis education and innovation to br exactly bring in uh, PhD level people to, 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 to industry uh, as, as we move on with the Industry, industry 5.0 journey. Okay and mm -hmm. the, yeah, the prolongation of the question is actually the, 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 the set of skills that uh, students of the next generation should have that goes very much in that direction, I guess. It's uh, it's a long, long discussion, a long topic, <laughs> probably. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think in broad terms, uh, the, the, it, it's not so much the, the, the skills that they have, but the, the, the way in which they are cap can use the skills that they will be, a, a, be adaptable, they'll be willing to be adaptable, and it will be really a case of, of lifelong skill development and uh, upskilling uh, throughout, throughout the mm -hmm. career. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so you know, clearly, 
the more there's a component, the fact that there's a combination of key technical skills together with the ability to, to, to be adaptable, that, that would be the key, a key combination. I see also in the chat that we have got a number of uh, more technical and detailed questions and some of them are more principal. Uh, uh, Mr. Rada is continuing uh, the discussion on the key principles, for instance, uh, saying that, uh, that there are three pillars shown, which you mentioned, but, uh, but there should also be key principles and he advocates for transparency, profit sharing, and efficiency as, as three of the possible key principles for industry 5.0. But, uh, but there is also one more general question and perhaps we can end there as, as we're running out of time with this one. And the question is that uh, is industry 5.0 complementary to industry 4.0 or is it its successor? So how do you see the big picture and relationship between the industry 4.0 and 5.0 concepts? Uh, we were seeing industry 5.0 certainly is more complementary. Um, mm -hmm. At the same time, we, we don't see it as a necessarily a, a, a logical process. It may be that there will be companies, um, as I said, that, that have had difficulty with uh, uh, reach, reaching their go into digitalization adoption, uh, adoption goals using the industry 4.0 approach, who can use, in fact, industry 5.0 as a way of, of achieving industry 4.0 as they go along. So the, 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 the relationship is, is not linear, um, but it, 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 certainly the, the relationship is, is, is harmonious and is intended in that way. It's not industry 5.0 versus industry 4.0, certainly not. Um, conditions in, in, in markets have changed dramatically uh, since uh, industry 4.0 was launched. And in a certain way, industry 5.0 tries to build on industry 4.0 uh, to take account of, of these more challenging circumstances in which we find ourselves, in addition to the evidence that there was that many companies had a lot of difficulty achieving industry 4.0, and that in a way, industry 5.0 can help to, to, to smooth the way towards uh, achieving uh, digitalization goals that, that uh, companies have. Thank you so much, uh, Sean for clarifying this. And uh, with that, uh, I think we need to move ahead with our next speaker. But just to clarify for, for our audience, uh, the questions which we were not able to directly get an answer from Sean, we will uh, come back to them individually and we will uh, try to, to get some answer there as a follow-on activity of, of this webinar. And, and uh, thank you once again, Sean. And let me now invite our next uh, speaker, who is uh, Christina Jogelainen uh, from uh, uh, Lapland in northern part of Finland. And uh, she will be talking about uh, green and uh, twin uh, green and uh, digital transition and, and their experiences in, in northern Finland. So, Christina, as, as I asked also, Sean, please firstly introduce yourself shortly about your background and activities, and then you have uh, 15 minutes for making your presentation. So, the floor is yours. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, Vene, and thank you very much about the for the previous speaker as well. And uh, and uh, now are we, we are going to have a different approach to this direction as uh, I come from the regional with a regional background from Lapland and I have my working career in the regional council of Lapland and and the university field and uh, I have to say I'm not the expert of industry 4.0 5.0 on any of the industries uh, the technological development but what is the expertise and what is the point of view what I'm trying to approach here is that how the regional development and, and, and uh, regional development authorities and local out development authorities could enable this, this uh, process of, of uh, digitalization and uh, what does it mean for our context in, uh, in, uh, when we talk about the green transition as well. And the reason where I come from, this uh, twin transition is, is a core really for, for sure because uh, we are very rich with the natural resources and that's, that's the core core for, for our development and, and our sustainability. And uh, as I said uh, shortly that I have a background on this, uh, this uh, regional development, but uh, we very strongly rely on our experts in our regions, what comes to the industry 
4.0 or 5.0. And uh, shortly to show that the uh, region of Lapland, it's, it's, a, it's a northernmost region of whole European Union and it's the most sparsely populated region. So it's, it's a size, it's, it's a several times of Belgium, but we are just less than 200,000 inhabitants there. And why I want to raise this up is simply because uh, we are middle of the natural resources. And, and uh, when we talk about industrial development, what is, uh, what is uh, typical for us is that uh, in our territory, in our region, we have some of the biggest global companies operating in the mining industry and the forestry industry. But at the same time, we are doing our best to develop the, the SME industries uh, in, a, in a different field, particularly when we talk about this case, we prefer the service industries who provides the services for the big industry, but also how we can support our research development and innovation actors to support this development. Because of course, if we think about the leading industry in a, in a mining and, and a forestry, the big large industries, they, they do their work. They, they are the leading, leading the and showing the direction for our SMEs that what is the, uh, the level of, of uh, application, digital applications, what you have to have to be able to adapt and use in your operations. And actually they are showing the, the demand and, and uh, to answer that demand, by our SMEs and our, our research, development, and innovation ac actors. It's, it's, the, it's the role where the regional authorities and regional uh, uh, funding comes that we can provide that support for them. And that is the approach and point of view what I'm gonna take here now. So uh, how we can actually enable and how we can make it happen in practice. So this is shortly just to show that, uh, first of all, the Lapland is also, we, we operate in the NUTS 3 level. In Finland, we practically, we don't have NUTS 2 level management authorities at all. So we go directly from the ministry level into the NUTS 3 level. And uh, that, is a, that is actually one of our privileges, I believe so, because that's the way how we can also keep all the regional development in very much in, in, in a, one hand on the way, if I put on that way. And when we talk about the principles of regional development, we talk, uh, we, we could, uh, in the same sentence, we talk about the uh, smart specialization and we talk about the uh, use of, of uh, poss possible European fundings to support the different kinds of activities and actions to, to direction of, of uh, green, green and digital transition. And uh, in Finland, uh, we developed Actually, in Lapland, we developed this green deal. What is the one of the reasons why we were invited to be in this uh, this seminar to explain that how that is actually providing the the kind of foundation, and that uh, we we wanted to take this uh, green deal uh, when it was launched in the European Commission some years ago. We wanted to actually turn to, to make our own translation. What does it mean in our circumstances? And, and how, we, how we can actually adapt those, those uh, core topics and issues in that, that uh, deal. Because uh, as I mentioned earlier, that uh, we are actually having some of the most important uh, mineral deposits in our territory, and, and which are very crucial to implement and put and turn the green deal in, into the practice. And the idea of the, uh, the aim of this green deal setting is to agree and, and, and to show the direction where we have to also put our forces while we want to implement and support digitalization. And um, this is a kind of common issue what we have in all northern regions in, in at the moment. And just uh, I wanted to highlight here also that if we, if you heard uh, the, the the speech of, of our president of European Union last week, where he actually highlighted this critical raw material act, it's 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 something what really impacts a lot in our economy, and and uh, actually at the same time it when it provides the huge possibilities, it also provides huge amount of 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 challenges and responsibilities because we are very much in the middle of these universal chains and opportunities. And uh, 
And when we talk about the sustainable development, it is definitely the foundation for the growth. And actually, when when I was listening this uh, highlighting, listening to some of the highlights uh, in uh, in this uh, industrial 5.0. Somehow I see that uh, from the very beginning, when we started to develop our smart specialization uh, about 10 years ago, this kind of principle, the human center principle and sustainability and resilience were there from the very beginning, because this is the only way how we can actually keep kind of uh, control sounds very bad, but uh, kind of control of our natural resources and make sure that, uh, that uh, there will be the uh, continuous economic development, but also the social benefit for the current generation, but also wants to come. And for that, it's a very crucial for us to support and, 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 and put a lot of effort on our research development and, in, and, and innovation ecosystems. And uh, to, the, to the resources what we have, we are lucky, lucky in Lapland also that uh, in addition of our university network, University and University of Applied Sciences. We also have our some of our national national research institutions have their location in in Lapland in our territory territory as well, which provide a lot of added value when we talk about this twin transition. And then what comes to the regional level, and as I mentioned, that uh, we are a combination of of uh, of uh, ecosystem where we have large companies, global companies. And actually, it's an everyday life for our SMEs working in the industrial service sector that they work with the international companies. But at the same time, we actually see that how we can actually enable and support them to find their specifications and their own specialization by providing the added value for these uh, big companies. And when it comes, for example, the case of mining industry, which I always like to use very much here, is that. Uh, it's a matter of social licensing as well. It's a matter of getting the acceptance of your operations is that you engage the local business into this, this field. And uh, some cases, 80% of the operations of the mines are in practice uh, uh, subcontracted and made by the local uh, service industry providers. Mm -hmm. And in order to do that, you also have to be in the in the in the top of latest development of digital solutions and, and digitalizations and being able to combine this for the daily operations what you provide for these big companies. And therefore we actually call this a kind of Arctic truffles as well because uh, combining these uh, circumstances where we are in the Arctic conditions, although we are of course impact the climate change very, very strongly as well, it's, it's actually provides the a uh, huge possibility for specialization and, 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 and specialization to provide the very specific services for the companies. But then, of course, what is our challenge is that uh, we are not that many. So, so, uh, so uh, we are having this everlasting uh, lasting, uh, uh, challenge with uh, uh, labor and, and uh, lack of workforce and skilled workforce. And then, of course, when we talk about, for example, the mining industry, mining industry is not very, very attractive as a such, and and to the to the history of the industry. But actually, when we talk about the mining industry today, it's 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 so automatized and it's so robotized industry, and 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 more. It's not the question of being the expert of mining, but it's being the expert for using these different kind of applications in in the industry. And, and know how to deal with this uh, uh, digitalized and automatized uh, uh, industrial services. So we we very strongly uh, because of the of the possibilities and because of the challenges what we have in our our region is also that uh, we have to develop our ecosystem uh, to see them as, as a big picture and really see that how we can find the different places and. When we talk about our specialization, we haven't really focused on the way that we have a certain domain is a certain sector of industry, but it's it's uh, the domain is that more like uh, to become a specialist and to specialize on those main sectors which are important. And of course, 
Although I just mentioned now here the mining and the forestry industry, we should not forget the uh, tourism and, and other local industries, which are very crucial when we come about the, when we talk about the uh, overall regional development. And uh, <clears throat> therefore, we have a very we have a very strong focus on this uh, this uh, kind of our own translation when we talk about the clusters. And, and I would like to talk about here more like a kind of way of doing collaboration as you collaborate when you operate in the cluster. And that way, the support to, to get the best available knowledge and expertise for the use of the industry and, and, and uh, operating together with the industry. And that is the focus where we actually develop when we talk about the uh, impact and influence what the management authorities and regional funds can do is that we actually strengthen these layers two and three on the way that they can provide the best added value for the industrial operations in the region. And therefore, uh, we have this uh, special kind of uh, practice what we have developed and what we call for our Arctic development environment cluster. Basically, we talk of, although I use the word cluster, it is a, it is a, it is a collaboration of, of uh, different kind of modern development environments and laboratories, which have been put under the one common clustering type of working in order to provide the best available expertise for the use of the industry. And this is something where we focus very much when we talk about the role of the regional authorities and regional funds that how we can actually make this working stronger and better for the for the benefit of the of the industry. And uh, and it's at the moment it's really like uh, 50 different kinds of development environments, including the simul simulton environment and and uh, and uh, laboratories and including also the educational environments which we provide to support, for example, industry to adapt the, the to test and, and the simulate this, uh, this uh, uh, roboticized practices, for example, in the minings and mines. What I could say that uh, out of three biggest operating mines, we have now two of the mines, they have been developed the real life uh, uh, simulation environment where actually as well as the students are operating and practicing their skills and learning to operate in the mine but the SMEs are using those very much when they are testing their services for the mine but the big mine the mining companies also use those environments while they are actually teaching and and, and educating their staff to operate in the mine and that is a very important also when it comes to the security issues and matters and um, some uh, final remarks, what we actually think about this uh, and how we are doing the, the step by step is that the, as a smart project. So, yes, so this is uh, this is the one of the delivery and the quality delivery of being the smart Interact Europe project. And, and there we have this, this uh, uh, action plan where we want to really stronger develop this industry digital transformation and to have this one-stop shop in Lapland, uh, Lapland and Arctic. But it's not just this development environment. It also integrates our cluster, which we call uh, Arctic, Arctic circular economy and industrial cluster, which is actually the cluster which is led by the big companies and, and the development agencies uh, supporting them. We actually, um, when we talk about, do we talk about the 4.0, 5.0? And, and in order to be honestly understanding the importance and the possibilities of 5.0 and how to adapt that, we all we, we this learned that we first have to understand what does it mean when we talk about the industry 4.0 in our circumstances? And what is it at the moment? And what is the level of that? And, 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 and uh, how that is actually supported and how how these different applications have been adapted by our SME businesses. And uh, when it linked with the Green Deal, uh, what we have made, the Green Deal is actually, it's the roadmap which is engaging and empowering industry and, and uh, different sectors and, and, and different actors operating in this regional ecosystem. 
it shows the direction. And then the smart specialization actually provides the governing system for the sustainable development. And actually the governing system also for transformation towards a sustainable industry. And then when we come to the step four part, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, I'm actually thinking and, and, uh, and uh, at the moment that uh, by without knowing, we have actually implemented and we actually have been applying these uh, fundamental pillars of, of 5 point, uh, industry 5.0, because it is the only way how we have been able to, to support this development in our, our territory. And something what I want to highlight here very shortly as well is that if we think about our region and we think about this, I again use the mining industry. And if you think about the innovation ecosystems, what we have in our regions, we have very good quality innovation ecosystem uh, located in, in, in uh, two main cities. But when we talk about the mine, the mine, of course, you have to you have to establish the mine where there is a possibility for that. You can't just go next to uh, ecosystem, and that means that, uh, for example, the one of the most uh, prominent uh, site at the moment, it's over 500 kilometer from the innovation ecosystem currently, and 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 what is between there, it's 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 uh, it's a uh, it's a nature. And, and villages and, and, and municipalities. And actually to transfer all these expertise and all this uh, digitalization, of course, that's the mine company who takes responsibility of that and, and, and how they can apply. But then how, how to actually develop the ecosystem around and being able to provide necessary industrial services and how to support our SMEs to, to answer that demand in, in the future, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of challenging question, but it also provides opportunities. But, uh, uh, and that's what we are really communicating quite a lot and thinking about quite a lot that how we can actually make and turn our development, research development and innovation actions in that level that it doesn't matter how far is the, is the, is the, is the uh, industrial plan or, or, or so on because uh, then we talk about uh, connections and everything like that as well. But our uh, development environment, what, uh, what is the case here in this situation is, is uh, has been one from the very beginning, regional digital innovation hub, but now it's also involved in one of the European digital innovation hub networks and their specialization there is the robotization in the mining, mining sites and the mining industries. And uh, from the management authority point of view, there is a very strong, willingness and, 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 and to find a way how we can actually generate this synergistic funding approach, what is very, very much uh, uh, supported by the European Commission. And we see all these regional development fund, just transition fund as a core, not to forget the social, uh, social fund as well, social, uh, regional social fund uh, plus as well, how we can actually find the kind of synergy and integration with the European growth and innovation programs. So that is that is the work what uh, what, they, what is a very important for us, and and uh, and and it was also very important that we had to create the understanding because it's a lot to understand when you want to keep the and 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 uh, and uh, put your resources and contribute your resources in the right direction when it comes to the industry four or industry five point zero zero uh, development. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Christina, for uh, sharing us the story of Lapland's uh, transition. Due to time limits, uh, we can only take one question. The remaining questions we will answer them individually. So, look if you if you would choose one question to Christina, which one would it be? <clears throat> uh, we, Rene, we, we we have some some questions from Michel, which are very specific to, mm -hmm. to the the case of uh, Lapland, and uh, so we will. Uh, Forward them to to Christina after the yeah. after the workshop uh, after the webinar because it's, uh, but uh, so so my, my my question would be uh, yeah exactly about this uh, the, the, this the, this transition and the um, and the support provided so if I if I understand well uh, you yeah you will you 
you you will build build up on the competences from the the um, well, we will we'll not introduce new initiatives. You build up on on the existing uh, uh, the, the 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 smart um, smart specialization strategy. You have the you have the digital innovation hub. You and you have the green deal, and you 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 will try to bring to emulate those those activities. Uh, you don't you you see it you see it as an ongoing development. Uh, Yes, and and uh, and I and I believe that in our case, when we talk about the smart specialization, we have to also include uh, the diversification word here because yeah. uh, with this diversification, we actually outreach to to other other regions and the European partners to support on that processes. But I would, if I, if you may, I would. Uh, so that is uh, that is exactly that we are trying to integrate and actually to see that how how to based on that what has been built on already yeah. and then where we have to find find the specialization but i see that michael had one very important question if i may answer to that does lapland recognize the human humans water soil as resource that should be protected yes and yes because this is it is all about that actually because we are middle of the water and we are middle of the forestry and 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 uh, we have a very uh, 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 how to say, pristine nature, but we want to take good care of it. And, and, uh, and not to forget the soil, of course. And that's why we talk about, um, we even launched the green mining at some point, because we wanted to highlight that it's all about that. And, and, uh, and we have been the one of the first regions who have been find highlighting that the circular economy starts from the beginning of the value chain because it's from the very beginning and 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 when it talks to when you when you have to dig the hole in the ground you start to provide waste immediately and that is something what we have to deal with and that is actually in the core of, of our our uh, uh, all development strategies and and uh, this debate and uh, ongoing discussion with the with the uh, inhabitants of the Lapland, it's 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 very important. It sometimes it's very painful as well, but it has you have to you have to have it. You have to have a dialogue. Thank you, Christian. Thank you. You've seen Thank Michael is very interested in your case, so if you agree, I will provide the contact details for for, for there could be some some exchange after that. Thank you. Thank you, Christina, once again. And now we move from uh, from far north to far south, uh, from Lapland to Catalonia. And our next uh, presenter is Sergio Martinez Perez. And uh, again, uh, Sergio, can you firstly introduce yourself shortly and then you have 15 minutes for your presentation. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, let me share my slides. Okay, so first of all, uh, good afternoon from sunny Barcelona to everyone over Europe. And uh, I would like to, to thank the policy learning platform for inviting us uh, to present our case study. Uh, this is uh, Sergio Martinez from the Secretary of Economic Affairs and European Funds from the Catalan uh, Regional Government. And I would like to talk to you about our approach on how to accelerate both uh, digital and green transitions. First of all, um, I will show you uh, the framework of our risk three strategy, the smart specialization strategy. Then um, I will go, uh, we will have an overlook of uh, the concept of uh, shared agendas, which is the approach we are using. And finally, I'll put the focus on um, how educational centers can help the green and digital transition uh, by showing you a couple of uh, projects as example that we have done uh, here. Okay, so uh, as you can see, th this is the scheme of our RISC-3 strategy 2030. This is not yet uh, public, but it's already approved by the, the European Commission. And I'm not going to go into detail about the strategy, which uh, would take uh, much longer. But I would uh, like to, to highlight uh, a few points. First of all, 
um, the strategy is committed to transformative, responsible research and innovation, and uh, in order to get a greener, more digital, more resilient and fairer socioeconomic model. We, uh, we will try to achieve this by the enabling technologies and by creating a new and digital, uh, digital and technology-based industry in order to transform the supply systems of uh, goods and, and services. All this is done with a shared, uh, sh shared agendas approach. And uh, what, do, what do we mean when we say shared agendas? So shared agendas are transformative innovation agendas that address the challenges relevant to, to society. And um, they allow us to move towards uh, patterns of more sustainable and inclusive development, always uh, linked to the SDGs. Um, I, I will give you um, an example on, on how we, we believe the, the shared agendas are, are useful. So with uh, today's, uh, nowadays global challenges such as climate change or inequalities or poverty or gender gap, et cetera, uh, we believe that uh, we need to, to give a, a collective answer, a multi-stakeholder uh, answer rather than um, individual uh, policies made by uh, each entity. So we, we think that there is a collect, collective awareness of these uh, problems since we, uh, I could say the, the climate change agenda is, is now on all um, international uh, bodies and governmental uh, bodies. But um, an example I, I, I think is very illustrative is that uh, recent study shows that if we if we want to to meet the the Paris Agreement uh, goals uh, agreed on the COP twenty one, we should uh, faster the decarbonization of the global economy five times uh, in the course of this uh, decade, faster than we have done it for the last two decades. Well, what do you, why do I mean with this? Uh, that we all have a collective awareness about how uh, damaging can be climate change, but um, we still feel uh, that there is uh, missing some collective action. So um, most climate change policies are, are defined by um, or influenced by uh, economic powers since they affect the economy. But we really believe that a new agents, diverse agents like, such as social or cultural agents should be involved in, in this uh, policy design. So that's, uh, that's what we try to achieve with our shared agendas approach. And now I'm going to, to focus on the two examples that I'm gonna show you, it's about educational centers. So one of our shared agendas in Catalonia is the zero waste and uh, green transition, which has the, the following obje objectives, uh, zero waste and circularity, delivering solution, solutions plus creating awareness about sustainability and engagement with their local environment, and enhancing trans transformative learning. And we have done this with uh, one pilot project with uh, vocational education uh, centers in the city of Granollers, and with another project with the Autonomous University of uh, Barcelona. So uh, vocational training centers and university are sources of uh, talent and knowledge. Uh, they are equipped with uh, technology, infrastructure, equipment that enables to bring um, to bring value and solutions to to the challenges of the of the territory. So I'll start with the first one. This is a pilot project, as I said, involving vocational training centers in the city of Granollers in the framework of the shared agenda for zero waste. The pilot project was um, 
was designed to generate collaborative dynamics in the sphere of circular economy among the training centers and public administrations and uh, companies in the city, uh, especially SMEs. Uh, the different players of the pilot uh, were the City Council of Granollers, different business associations, the Intersectoral Business Union, the SME Association, PIMEC, the Chamber of Commerce, and both uh, major trade unions, plus two vocational training centers. This uh, started back in 2019. It was, uh, uh, it was um, first in uh, pilot for a year, but then as, as you know, the, the pandemic, the COVID pandemic came in. And uh, of course, like for like to all of us affected the project and, and uh, the way of, of um, coordinating uh, the players, etc. So uh, we had an extension of an extra year. So all in all, it was two years. So how it worked. So based on the zero weight shared agenda, the vocational training students redefined the, the challenge on the following. How can they promote using digital technologies that are easy to use and maintain solutions that enable the reuse, recycling, or reduction of waste generated by SMEs on the industrial region of uh, Granollers. Then uh, at schools, uh, more specific problems or, or challenges uh, came ahead and, and were identified. And here, I wanna give you three examples of the challenges they, uh, they defined. Energy generation from wastewater, energy generation from coffee husks, or digitalization of documents and processes at small companies. So as you can see, the challenges are diverse. Ones are more complex, ones are more simple. But the idea was, since you have different branches at the vocational schools, so you can have the energy and water branch uh, that can focus, for example, on water control and management for the, for the first challenge. The chemical engineering branch can focus on the power generation aspect uh, or on the antioxidant aspect of uh, coffee husks. The commerce and marketing branch can focus more on market analysis. The IT branch can focus more on how to digitalize documents. So each branch of each vocational center was uh, focusing on a specific part of the, of the challenge. Uh, what can we say about the main results? So uh, students were acting as drivers of change, first of all. Then uh, they were working, working with companies in their immediate environment. And finally, the human talent and techno technological equipment for him was able to, for improving competitiveness and accelerating this uh, green and, and digital transition. So all in all, what can we say about this, um, about this pilot project? It generated a, a commitment between local stakeholders. And even though with the COVID pandemic in the middle, uh, they started uh, working for projects uh, with some concrete challenges for, for the companies. And uh, our hope is this uh, has some inertia and that they can uh, keep on going and continue with this. And we as a regional government, we're going to stand by and, and you know try to, to guide them. And the second example. You have five the, minutes left, sir. Sure, OK, sorry. thank you. The second example is the Ideas Generation Program of the Autonomous University of Barcelona. This program uh, is aiming to foster the entrepreneurial spirit and culture of innovation and to support the research staff in training at the university to model ideas based on the challenges proposed by society. So the different players of uh, this project is the 
the P30 Hub, which is a platform created back in 2018 by the Research Park of uh, the Autonomous University, Eurecad, which is a technological center, the university itself, and the B30 Association, which includes um, city councils of all the municipalities at the region, um, institutions, uh, business uh, associations, etc. So this idea generation program consists of three phases. So it's the first uh, phase, uh, the ideas lab with, it consists of participative sessions with four LX players where they explore social perceptions of a challenge. They define a shared vision of a certain challenge. They generate ideas or they explore and validate different lines of uh, research and, and innovation. Then there is a second phase, the idea generation, which is a multi multidisciplinary groups working on business models from research and innovation ideas. And at the end of this stage, uh, they present their, their ideas to a jury. And finally, on the third phase, the development of prototypes. So those ideas selected on the second phase, they can develop uh, the prototypes at the laboratories of the uh, Open Labs Network of the University, uh, the Autonomous University of Barcelona. So when it comes to results here, you have some figures of it. So you can see there's a million and a half euro uh, mobilized of uh, private capital for those projects and 11 companies created. And uh, just a few hint about the funding of the projects. I I, ha I don't have like the exact of them because uh, we were many actors participating, but I can definitely tell you it was um, small budget since uh, we basically needed uh, so time and human resources to, to attend the meetings, uh, to coordinate, but uh, the funding for a certain project was uh, was coming, uh, of course, from uh, from private funding. So when it comes to to the project, to starting the the pilot project in Granollers and the ideas generation program, it was a, a very small budget. So this is um, our shared agenda's approach in the framework of the risk-free strategy. Uh, I hope that you liked it, and uh, questions are welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sergio, for uh, sharing those two great examples. And uh, look, we have a time exactly for one question. So what, yeah, we, which one? We, we, we have two, so maybe we can have short answers. Yes, short <laughs> answers first, to two the, questions. Sergio, the, the, the first question from um, Lucia. Can you give an example of social agents which have participated in the shared agenda process? Maybe there are, shortly. we are, um, for example, in the in the Granollers project, there, there were um, um, the vocational training consilium as well, which is formed by different associations. So it capillarizes, you know, the civil society there. It's a consilium that was created a few years ago already and is uh, trying to influence the vocational training policies in in Spain. So th this is at a local level. So the agents represented are local, all of them. Okay, thank you. And the second one, let's see if it's possible to give a short answer. Uh, as a dealing with SMEs and twin transition, uh, what would you say? Which aspects related to Industry 5.0 of the uh, make small companies uh, better prepared or more ready to attract uh, investments? Well, definitely startups and the technological sector are companies that are um, probably uh, more used um, to these uh, funding rounds. But uh, what our aim, you know, is to reach all the companies. You know, it's um, very easy to help those companies that um, are already used on how to deal with uh, 
with an European call, with a private investor, and it's much more difficult to reach those uh, family companies, you know, micro companies. We have uh, uh, 68% micro companies in Catalonia. Okay. So uh, most of them family companies. So it's uh, harder to just to get them, you know, we, with the right information and then involve them uh, to try to embrace the industry 5.0. So uh, there's a lot of work to do ahead. Thank you, Sergio. Honey, maybe we can go a few minutes over time for the last presentation. Yes, yes, indeed. I would like to ask uh, the participants, if possible, to stay uh, even beyond the initially planned uh, end of the webinar uh, for perhaps five to ten minutes extra, because the next speaker, Oliver Kuschel from uh, Germany, who is speaking about impact factories, is certainly very inspiring and uh, and a presentation to, to to pay attention so please stay if you can and uh, with that i will now invite oliver to take the floor and as as with previous speakers please firstly introduce yourself and then you have 15 minutes for your presentation yes thanks renee can you see something it works well, Oliver. You can it go works. on. Right. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, good. Thank you. Oh, well, yeah. Hello from uh, Duisburg in the middle of Germany, um, where it used to be the biggest industrial area in Europe. You know, all the coal mines and steel factories have been here, but that changed. So, um, yeah, I found together with my, uh, with my partner, um, the Antropia, um, a nonprofit organization in 2018, end of 2018. And then we asked for funding from private foundations for our idea to uh, set up an incubator accelerator for so-called impact startups. And that worked, pretty out, worked out pretty well. And I would like to tell you a bit about this and our learnings. And that's maybe interesting for you because I guess impact startups are not much different whether they're located in Germany or elsewhere in Europe. So let's just check. Okay. Yeah, that was a direction I guess we were heading in the past. Yeah, um, obviously the wrong direction. And um, yeah, and I hope, and we all hope that the new initiative Industry 5.0 will change this. So I think pictures are all good. So the reason is um, I'm presenting this because always when I try to explain what we are doing here at the Impact Factory, our incubator, I always explain it with, with this thing, with a donut. And um, I think, yeah, what has a donut to do with us, with us working at the Impact Factory, with our startups, but maybe with you as well, yeah? And that um, was introduced by Kate Rayworth in the year 2012, when she was working for the charity organization Oxfam. She thought we need a different model to describe where the industry and the economy has to go. And she in invented this donut model. And um, you see in the middle of this a hole. And she said, okay, we always have to stay on the donut with our activities. So if you look at the social foundation that's building the hole, where you see all these um, things that we should to take care of when we act as, um, as uh, industry partners and collaborators. And um, so the social foundation cannot be harmed by anybody and that was in the past yeah yeah too much yeah so if, if you look at water if you look at food if you look at gender equality social equity all these values yeah haven't been cared for in the past and that is really necessary so and the good thing we heard a lot about uh, sustainable development goals you can arrange all the sustainable development goals within this um model so it doesn't matter whether it's uh, energy, uh, clean water, zero hunger, health, education, all this I won't go through. You see for the social foundation, all these sustainable development goals um, uh, um, are set. And if we look then at the outer part of the donut, yeah? So that's a safe and just space for humanity, what I described. And the outer part is the ecological ceiling that has to be maintained. And in the past we didn't do, yeah, see all the climate crisis and all this stuff. 
So we are permanently overshooting our boundaries. And uh, obviously, we're having a big problem with this right now. So we can arrange the last four SDGs for these courses. Yeah. And then if you think in the future, if you act as an industry partner, I'm still do I'm still on the donut or I'm yeah in the middle of the hole acting with my uh, with my industry or maybe outside of it, then it's a wrong direction. So that's at least our definition that we use a lot. And uh, I think it's um, it's a very good picture. OK, so if I translate now. Um, where is industry uh, 5.0 now located? I think, yeah, if we do it right, it's right here. Yeah, it's right on the donut. It's industry 5.0. And we heard from, from Sean, sustainable, human-centric, and resilient. So and hopefully, this is the, the direction where we are all heading in the future when it comes to industry work. Oh, well. So what has the donut to do with us? And I say the donut economy provides a vision of our industry that aims beyond efficiency and productivity as the sole goals and reinforces the role and the contribution of industry and to society and ecology. So that's what I at least understand um, uh, from industry 5.0 and that's obviously the case where all our startups are heading. Okay, now what is an impact startup? We are asked quite often and I always answer, yeah, an impact startup sets the achievement of a positive impact on at least one SDG, one of the 17 I showed you, without harming another SDG in the center of its business model. And that is really important, yeah? In the center of the business model has to be um, the achievement one from at least one SDG, yeah? And uh, that's always, we look at if they apply for a program, we look, okay, is that really the case? If not, you're not the right startup for us. And um, yes, that's where we are sitting. You wouldn't uh, think Duisburg looks like this, yeah, where it was a lot of industry, but we are located right next to the, the house left of us. It's the founding house from the Haniel family. 270 years ago, they founded their, their first business and it's uh, still active. So Haniel was once the richest family in Germany. It's no longer the case, but they're still very rich and they have a beautiful place and they allow us to stay in the old guest house that they built here. And we are very happy that we... Yeah, that we can work here. And all the startups are coming here quite regularly. That's pretty cool. Okay, so the scope, if you look at what kind of um, uh, um, startups we are supporting, you can see here uh, it's marked in red. It's, it's, it's going from charities, charity organizations who maybe only get donations and subsidies. Yeah, uh, on the left-hand side, to the real impact enterprises who um, save most of the money for themselves um, and not distribute it to shareholders. To the right-hand side, where still CSR and impact is in the core of the company, but totally profit-oriented. And that's most the case in green tech companies or maybe digital healthcare stuff you will find on the right-hand side. So that is the scope startups ha have to be in yeah, um, before we take them into our program, what we do every half year. And that's uh, when we started um, three and a half years ago, that was the, the um, program that we set up. And normally a program looks, uh, yeah, in the past at least, it looked all the same. It was the same program for all startups. We said we have to modelize this um, and uh, to attract more startups, depending on where are they in the life cycle of a startup. So either you now can step in being a creator, we call them. Yeah, if you have come in with an idea, we check, yeah, okay, what kind of problem are you tackling? And uh, is it a real relevant problem? Is there anybody want, uh, uh, paying money for, for your solution and stuff? We check this before you spend money and time for prototyping your product or service. So that's what we are doing in the first five months in the creator phase, or you step in as a ramp up. Second phase, you already come in with your prototype or MVP, minimum viable product. And then we, we help the startups and the founders maybe to found their company yeah, and step into the market um, uh, with marketing and sales uh, um, uh, um, activities and all this, and maybe find a, a funding partner for you, whether it's a business angel, a venture capital firm, or any other who is financed this is. In the, in the least cases, 
startups can finance themselves out of their own cash flow, obviously. Or you are at a later stage and you are scale up and we, you, know, you already entered the market and your company is growing. We help um, the startup then growing um, their impact, their business, and with growing with their business is a growing impact as well. So you see, we attract a lot of startups. There was a program that was there. We founded the company. Nobody knew us. And then we said, okay, we are here. That was the beginning of 2019. Yeah, we are a new accelerator called Impact Factory. Please apply. We didn't know what was happening. And when we said, okay, we are not having the, only the program, we have in um, the ecosystem. And uh, yeah, in our region, there are 100,000 uh, um, companies um, from Dortmund to Duisburg. So a lot of industry around here, and that is very attractive for startups. So we said, okay, beside our founding and funding partners, Weisheim Stiften, Handel and KW Stiftung, we have all these companies that you see here that go into our program that help the startups to grow. Yeah, they are experts from all types of uh, um, directions. And, and on the left-hand side, all the financing partners that a startup obviously needs. So that we applied and then we shouted out and said, okay, please apply. And first, first stage, we said, yes, it should be a regional incubator because that was normally the case from incubators in Germany, they are all regional. Yeah, said, okay, we have, you can co-work here and you come from the university and we targeted the same, but we failed. Yeah, so of course, if you look here, that's uh, obviously Germany. That's the status right now. Yeah, we, we are now dealing with 100. Only about five minutes left. Okay, thanks. We are, we are dealing with 171 startups. We are in batch seven right now. And you see our, our region, the rural region, there are a few startups from here, but there are a lot from all over Germany. And that was really astonishing. And we said, hmm, maybe a regional incubator is not really necessary. The startups want to come here quite regularly and match with the others. And that was a learning that we had. And we are, yeah, we are very satisfied that we can, as being a startup by ourselves, attracting startups from all over Germany, even 24 startups from Berlin applied for our program and we took them into our program. So um, SDGs, we heard a lot. And um, yeah, Sean said uh, SDG 9 and 12. Uh, yeah, if you look at industry um, uh, 5.0, the most important, and you see we already have uh, 58 um, startups and uh, within this uh, that, that they tackle these two SDGs mainly, but we have SDG 3, where it goes to healthcare and well-being a lot of well. So we're tackling all uh, 17 SDGs with our 171 startups that we support, and yeah, we're very proud with this um result and the, we talked about uh, diversity 40 percent female that's if if you look at um education and social welfare a lot of women active yeah and it's normally startup founders 17 percent only uh, female we have 40 that's very good and if you look at the age obviously uh, young people um, but we have a lot of silverpreneurs like me, um, older than 50 years, 14% of the founders are older. And that's a very cool thing as well. So lessons learned in the last four years. Um, only digital content and digital meetings is not enough to build up a community that sticks together. So you saw our house, we invite them. At least every four weeks they are coming, not all of them, but a lot of them, yeah. And we're having a mixture. Every every two weeks we meet and we we um, we have a um, physical meeting and then a digital meeting and then a physical meeting again. So, um, but it's roughly sixty percent physical here in Duisburg, where the startups are coming from all over Germany. So you need a physical place to build a community that really sticks together. That is our learning. Only digital is not working, but one physical place in Germany is enough. We learned. The startups don't care if they come from Berlin. They like to come here and um, chat with the others. They're all trying to do something good. So we have a really sticky community build up. Startup founders are mostly interested in network from uh, contacts and funding leads. Yeah, And Impact Factory is planning to set up its own funding facility in a form of foundation. Because we see funding is very important in the second stage in the ramp up phase. And only program is not enough. So we are trying to provide in um, being the first 
investor as a foundation yeah we're not we're not going for profit we are going to uh, yeah to support them to reach the next stage maybe series a investment stage where then a bunch of capital firms like impact investors step in they're not stepping in in the incubation phase yeah and the bigger the community the less important is the programmatic content obviously we started only with the content in our network and then you see we started program right hand side and the external network that I showed you, and that attracted the people. And now we have a big startup community. And you, if you look at the stage right now, I'd say it's from the importance. Yeah, I said, okay, if I have to um, uh, divide uh, the importance in percentage, now our startup community is the biggest asset that we have, more than 400 founders from all over Germany. The external network is growing, was growing heavily, very important, but the startup community more important. And the program, that's what I said, still important, but not that important because the startups, they want really to, uh, to get close contact with all their peers. Okay, thank you for having me. And if there are any questions, yeah, please ask thank you thank you oliver for uh, such a great and inspiring presentation about your approach and uh, let us take then again one question look if you will will be able to choose out of those which have been put to the chat <clears throat> yes we um we, we we well we have several ones and um, i will i will take the last one coming in um how many Funded startups exist till two years after launch, roughly. Do you have a... Um... Funded startups? I don't know. Yeah, I would say startups. doesn't matter whether they're funded or not. Sometimes they're still existing without funding. That's... Um, um, I no, haven't fund, counted... Fund, ex, oh, yeah, let's take all of them. Yeah, without, yeah, without, right. without funding. Yeah. Okay. So we, we counted, I think, from 171 that we took in our program, I, I think roughly... 10 have resigned. So 160 are still active. Yeah. So how successful they are and how big they are, that depends, obviously. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But um, I think it's a good quota. Yeah. Because we are really taking care, trying to connect them with people they support them, they need. Yeah. And it's, it's a mixture of getting the right contact in the right time and getting the money that you need. And that's what we are yeah, going for. And it works out pretty well. Okay, thank you, Oliver. Thank mm -hmm. you, Oliver. And uh, with other questions, uh, we will uh, communicate those questions yes. directly to Oliver, and everybody will get an answer. Maybe, maybe one question, just shortly. Yeah. The, yeah the, because the last one is really interesting. Do you have in plan to expand the program, a community at European level, or any? any yeah. Because this, uh... And right now, as I said, we are we haven't got any euro from uh, mm -hmm. from from uh, uh, public funds either from the state or from the city or from the EU. We are just private funded. Yeah, so I don't know. If the EU finds it interesting and gives us money, we can we can expand. <laughs> right now we are, yeah, so we are only six people working here. So um, international is, a, yeah, it's another speech. Yeah, so it's, yeah. I, I think we will, but then we obviously need money. And I don't know whether private foundations are normally funding an international um, strategy. If so, yeah, uh, we are open. Yeah, we are we are non-profit. We don't have to, yeah, we're not seeking for profit. So we are open to share our experience yeah. and our network with everybody. Yeah. I Thank think, you, Oliver. Oliver, there is a great demand of uh, of scaling up the impact factor rate concept across <laughs> Europe. So, so you have a potential certainly for okay. scaling up activities mm -hmm. and good, good luck, of course, with that. Yes. Uh, having said that, I, I want to take this opportunity and uh, thank uh, all the presenters today for uh, for those uh, very inspiring presentations and and hopefully also illuminating how the industry 5.0 concept can be viewed from different angles and aspects and and of course uh, good luck to everybody uh, with implementing your initiatives and projects in this area just to summarize on a technical side, uh, we will put together a short summary of uh, the webinar, of, of the main, uh, main points presented and, and the recommendations given. And we will share it together with uh, the presentations and uh, video recording of the webinar 
to the all participants of the webinar. And uh, of course, everybody is most welcome to, to take a look at what Interreg Europe Policy Learning Platform has to offer, apart from webinars. We, of course, offer other services such as, for instance, peer reviews, matchmaking sessions, uh, policy briefs, uh, and, and other events. So please, please stay, stay on uh, following as uh, Interreg Europe Policy Learning Platform activities. Thank you once again to everybody and uh, looking forward to see you in next meetings and uh, events of uh, Policy Learning Platform. Thank you and bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.